Hi there, welcome to this lecture on um, the media and crime for the um, AQA sociology course. This is actually a follow-up lecture to my previous one on postmodernism, the media and crime, so I'd suggest watching that one first. Um, this is, if you like, um, a recap of what's learned in that lecture um, and going over some of the new content for the new specification, because that original one was made for the old specification. Um, so, if you have watched that previous lecture, fantastic. Um, this is a lecture review question sheet. Um, if I teach you, I hopefully will have shared this file with you or printed it off. Um, please, can you spend five to ten minutes just trying to fill out as much as you can remember from that previous lecture on this sheet? Um, do it without your notes and then have a go with your notes just to fill in the gap. Okay, so this is going over. Um, the majority of the content that you do need to know for the postmodernism and media uh, part of the sociology unit. Um, like I said, I'm going to teach you some of the new content in this lecture now. So, um, in terms of the new content, um, uh, news values are um, on the new specification. Um, <clears throat> and Cohen and Young uh, argued, and th those names hopefully ring a bell, because you've got Stan Cohen, uh, Moral Panics, and of course Jock Young, who we have come across uh, in uh, neo-Marxism, symbolic interactionism, you know, deviancy amplification and what have you. So names we're definitely familiar with. Anyway, they argued that news is not something that's objectively discovered, but it's actually manufactured, it's created via a social process. Um, therefore, it is a social construction because it creates a distorted picture of crime that merely reflects um, society's view of what crime is and should be. And I, when I say society, it's quite often the more influential groups of people in society's view about what is going on with crime. Um, and this is done via something called news values. And this is a criteria that journalists and editors use to sort through stories to decide um, whether to publish them or not, and in what order to publish them. So this is very much, like I said, a social process of prioritisation and choosing on what to report or not report. So this is quite different to one of the theoretical perspectives that I talked about in my previous lecture. So have a think about that lecture, which you've hopefully watched. Um, which theoretical perspective believes that the news is an objective reporting on what's actually going on out there? Which believes the media is an objective agent reporting on reality, particularly the, the news. So <clears throat> you can use news values to challenge that perspective's view on what the news does. So what are these news values? Well, here they are. There's immediacy. So if it's breaking news, is it happening straight away? Is it, how recently has it happened? Uh, and that will bump it up the news agenda. Dramatization, like is there action? Is there excitement? Is there, is there a notion? Is there like an, an element of urgency about it? Personalization, so anything with a human interest story about individuals is likely to kind of get bumped up the news agenda. Um, higher status, uh, do, does the story involve celebrities or important people, politicians, what have you. Um, simplification, is the story simple enough to understand and report on to the majority of um, the audience? That's one of the reasons why we don't get many news stories on um, white collar crime, um, corporate crime. Because there's a load of grey, um, diffusion of responsibility, diffusion of victimisation, um, news stories like kind of clear-cut villains and clear-cut victims, if you like. <clears throat> Risk is an interested one. Uh, this is like when you will get very victim-centred stories about vulnerability and fear. Uh, these sorts of stories tend to be really popular um, and they are often bumped up the news agenda. And many might argue that that is kind of, uh, sort of the dark function of the media, making us kind of worried and fearful about things and controlling us in some way. <clears throat> and, of course, violence. If, if a story involves a vi violent act, uh, particularly if it's a very spectacular and visible violence, then that is very much going to get covered. Um, if you want to do your own bit of content analysis, which is obviously how we research documents, um, have a click on, well, you, that click link won't, won't work, but go on to the Daily Mail website um, and you can just count how many crime stories can you see. There's probably going to be quite a few more than, and again, that's part of the distortion. It's kind of overemphasizing the level of criminality. And then when you look at those crime stories, can you see any elements of the news values that I've just discussed with you? Um, and that would be collecting evidence that news values seem to be being used by the Daily Mail editors and how they report on what's actually happening. Um, another bit of content analysis for you, um, look at the <clears throat> BBC iPlayer category of true crime and 
have a quick scan through at the uh, factor documentaries and how might we, we're going to have a go at analysing them from a sociological perspective. So we've got four there, and there's many more below there. Uh, murder in Mayfair, reported missing, I think that's a search helicopter. Uh, the gold inside story about the, the biggest gold um, robbery in the UK. And Darkland, hunting the killers. Um, not one that I watch or I know much about, but... It's pretty obvious that it's about violent murder, possibly of children, it looks like as well. So nasty stuff. So from a sociological perspective, what conclusions can we kind of draw from this? And please do have a quick look on the BBC true crime category before I move on, because you get to have a, a much bigger picture of the sort of um, shows that they're, they, they're putting into that category. Um, the way we've linked, the way I've linked it to um, the iPlayer coverage is um, that it does distort what's happening with crime because the majority are about violent and sexual offences and, and the majority of crime day to day is, is not that type of crime it's it's low level criminality it's it's street crime it's it's not not necessarily it's not violent sexual offences so and this is what's known as dramatic fallacy which felson argues that where the media overplays these extraordinary crimes and overreports on it and makes documentaries about it. So we're all talking about it as if it's kind of all out there and we should be really concerned about it. Particularly that documentary about the gold heist, for example, that was an extraordinary crime. It, you know, it's one of, almost one of a kind in the UK. Um, and yet it's got so much coverage that you sort of think that maybe people are out there robbing gold all the time. Um, in terms of news values, what can we see? Well, there was lots of personalisation, human interest stories, and there was definitely elements of novelty and new angles, look, looking over old crimes. But there was a lot of risk, so victim-centred stories about vulnerability and fear, uh, particularly about women. Uh, violence, uh, I think two or three of the ones we could see on the previous um, slide were about murder, for example, so very visible and spectacular acts. And Marxists would highlight there's a real lack of crime, of documentaries about crimes of the powerful, not much occupational crime or white collar crime. And, and that is because it's, it's, it's arguably boring or it's complex and there's not enough time to investigate it. And <clears throat> despite the fact that there's quite a lot of reporting at the moment about um, sort of brutality in the police, corruption in the police, sexism in the police, racism in the police, misogyny in the police. We're not seeing that come through in a lot of uh, these sort of crime documentaries. So from a sociological point of view, you might kind of conclude, well, hang on, that, that's a bit manipulative in terms of our value set. The, the, the media is not reporting on the dark side of the police force very much. And is that because um, uh, the ruling class, the, the power elite, they, they don't want us to perceive our police in that way? That would be like a Marxist or symbolic interactionist analysis. Or perhaps it's a methodological problem. The police, because they are under investigation and there's all this negative reporting about them, are they just like absolutely refusing to let any documentaries be made about them in that way? Anyway, it's your conclusion, you can draw that and you can analyse that in your essays. Um, another theory you need to be aware of when it comes to the media and crime is cultural criminology. Now, if we think about how relative deprivation um, can explain how the media causes crime, that contrasts quite a lot with cultural criminology. So um, relative deprivation theory is the argument that the media kind of stokes relative deprivation by reporting on lavish lifestyles, making us all very jealous of the material goods the richer people have, and that can make some individuals make the choice to commit crime in order to own a Mercedes in order to be able to wear Gucci clothing, in order to be able to afford a nice house. And that, that, that's how relative the media, sorry, can lead to crime because of relative deprivation. It can make a sense of relative deprivation seem stronger by showing us how relatively poor we are compared to other people. Now, this is different to what's known as cultural criminology. Um, which argues that actually the media has turned crime itself into the commodity, okay? Um, and people want to consume it. They desire and want to consume crime. Um, and Hayward and Young sort of built on this and say that um, late modern society is media saturated and with an emphasis on consumption and excitement, which crime certainly delivers. Because um, crime <clears throat> can be easily turned into a commodity or even a style of dress or acting or behaviour that can be consumed. And corporations use these sort of images of crime to sell products. 
especially to the young, which is a bit disturbing. Um, and the argument might be we're in influence, uh, in, immersed in what's known as a mediascape, where there is images of crime um, and there's a blurring between the image and the reality of crime, where what we think of is maybe we're being shown true crime, actually it's something that's been set up or manipulated or dramatised to make it seem a bit more exciting, perhaps. So, for example, gang assaults being staged on the, for the camera and then made into like underground fight videos as if it's been recorded on a, a hidden camera, but actually it's there with a professional cameraman and a camera, but they kind of just use certain angles and shots to make it look like it's kind of undercover or covert. Ross Kemp on gangs and TV shows such as Cops. Like, there's no surprise that they're always there at the most dramatic moments of a chase or um, an encounter with a rival gang or, or what have you, because it's been set up for dramatic effect, and that's distorting our perception of what's actually going on. Um, so when we think about this kind of commodified commodification um, of crime, uh, and it being packaged and marketed to young people um, as exciting, cool and fashionable. Um, there are examples like things like Grand Theft Auto. Uh, think of the, the, the branding that goes on within that game uh, to kind of encourage to sell products to, to people, both young people as in kids, but also adults as well. Like the designer, designer goods that we see in there, the kind of the, the, the fashion, the clothes. Um, but also the actual game itself, it's a, it's a commodity of crime. It's, a, it's um, people buying a, a game that they get to act and behave criminally in, and it's exciting. So as a company, they've commodified, commodified crime. They're selling it to us. We're buying it. We're playing it. And then we're buying the next version of it. And they're making a fortune out of it. Um, and then you've also got some fashion, okay, that kind of glamorizes aspects of, you know, um, you've got heroin chic on the left there, and like sort of gang tags, graffiti, fashion, tattoos, that kind of um, fashion as well, and making it seem sort of cool and fashionable. So, can you think of any other example of cult counterculture commodification where we sort of see counterculture um, a bit like? Um, uh, the subcultural theory of resistance from neo-Marxists where you might have seen um, things like the punks um, and their anti-society stance become involved or their symbols being immersed into mainstream society, for example, in terms of fashion and, and music. So the last thing I want to talk to you about um, from the new spec is global, global cybercrime. Um, so this is a mixture of kind of well postmodernists are interested in it because it's globalization and technology and it's certainly the role of media as well because it's predominantly operated via different communications technology as well so that's definitely the media so thomas and loder define cybercrime as computer mediated activities that are either illegal or considered illicit and are conducted through global electronic networks and dukes um, argued that the internet creates opportunity for conventional crimes such as fraud uh, drug dealing, uh, what have you, but also for brand new crimes are using new tools. So software piracy, you might know someone who's been affected by this where uh, their computer's been hacked and the organisation or the individual responsible has put some horrible uh, software on there. That means they can't access their computer and they have to pay a fine. Well, it's not really a fine, is it? It's um, almost like a a bribe or a hostage payment in order to get access to their computer again. Okay, so we're also seeing some new crimes emerge because of the use of the internet and technology. Trolling, trolling for example, is a lot more hate crime that takes place online um, <clears throat> as well. So uh, Wall uh, said there were four categories for cyber crime. Cyber trespass, such as hacking. Cyber deception, things like identity theft. Cyber pornography, maybe things like revenge porn, but also cyber pornography, of course. Cyber violence, such as text bullying, maybe that would be where um, tro trolling, trolling, trolling would go in. And can you think of any other examples of these different types of cyber crime that you could add to your notes? So these are all kind of, if you like, crimes that, you know, prior perhaps to the, the internet, we didn't really have that much of them. So in some ways, globalisation and globalised 
technology, sorry, has led to an increase of, of these different types of crime. Now, you can definitely argue that one of the big problems with global uh, cyber crimes is it's really difficult to police. It's a huge area to kind of try and police. And is it realistic for, for national police forces to police a global internet? Like, probably not, because it's so huge. And within the internet, you've got the dark web, you've got proxy servers, you've got all kinds of ways for people to avoid being monitored and detected if they know how. And there's all the limited police resources. And can, like I said, a national police force effectively police the internet? Probably not. They haven't got the money for it. They haven't got the skill set for it. Um, many of the people who are perhaps clever enough to kind of enact many, much of this global cr cyber crime, they're probably the ones being the criminals more than the police people trying to collect the, the, catch them. And of course, there's the globalised nature. Who is responsible and problems of jurisdiction? So do in when it comes to the internet if somebody is looking at illicit images i say illicit images or um, illegal images online uh, the images uh, were uploaded in thailand the person looked at them in the uk um you know is it is it some difficulty in kind of working out well who is responsible for that crime who how do you punish the person uploading the images even though and definitely how do we kind of track them through the maybe the technology that's been used in the first place um and finally there's the issue around policing culture uh, cyber crime is pretty boring um compared to maybe some of the more glamorous crimes out there uh that's not really the most exciting uh type of policing because it's generally sat in front of a computer it's also quite hard sometimes, um, global cybercrime, because it's looking at through uh, a lot of quite difficult images and cases um, that can actually be quite draining on a police officer um, psychologically, for example. On the other hand, surveillance technology has led to an increase in crime detection. We've got uh, amazing sort of ICT technology now that provides the police and authorities with greater chances to, for surveillance and control of the population. So obviously that does sound a bit dark, the control of the population. But because of the kind of improvements in tracing and tracking technology online, we are able to detect many crimes that would otherwise be going on um, undetected. But there's the growth of CCTV cameras, electronic databases, digital fingerprinting, smart identity cards, and listening devices. All of these I mean that the police and authorities have more tools available to them in order to detect crime and police it at both a national and a global level. And that is, on the one hand, a positive for preventing crime. However, many would also look at this as a negative that the police and authorities have such a, hard, a large range of surveillance technologies available to them to police their own populations. So just to finish this, I want to recommend um, another um, uh, video uh, from another um, YouTuber uh, from uh, the Teacher Sociology uh, channel on how to write um, an A-star um, answer on uh, crime and media. Um, and if you type into YouTube, A-star sociology paper three, crime and media, you should find it. Um, and like I said, it's the teacher sociology who's published this, um, this particular video. Um, I'd recommend watching the lecture and uh, creating a template for a detailed essay plan once, as you watch it. Once you've got your essay plan, uh, there's a few things you can do with it just to kind of make sure that you are thinking about what makes a good essay. Um, use um, a highlighter or colour to identify the key concepts, theories and sociologists use, so that's your knowledge. Use a second colour to identify the application to the question, your AO2. Use a third colour to highlight the evaluation, your AO3. Um, but also draw the arrows to show the chain of reasoning that's developed for the essay. So that also fits in with your um, AO3 skill as well. Um, so that's just a nice way to finish this particular topic. Um, if you have the time to watch a th what will now be a third lecture on the media and crime essay. Um, if I'm teaching you this topic, I'll let you know whether I want you to do this before our lesson or not, um, or do it. It's just part of your revision. Thanks very much for listening.